guys. Doug Childs here. Rich, it's Warriors and... Wild man, that's what's up. What's up, Doug Childs? Yeah. Oh, man. Smoking a stick, talking to my buddy. And, uh, Rich, I'm doing it again, man. I'm drinking the devil's backbone right here, right now. We ought to hit him up for a sponsorship. It's it's a nice it's a nice uh, it's a nice brew, brother. We, we should, but I'm uh, I'm drinking the the nectar of the gods right now. I'm drinking coffee. Still early. Over hey, man. There. Coffee, water, beer, vodka, scotch. That's all you need. Period. Boom. And hey, uh, I got a, I got I've got a uh, I got a bit of wisdom for you, Rich, that I've learned as a granddad. Uh, and I think I told you this in in Yuma is um, number one, you're a grandfather, but I don't know if you've learned these lessons yet. If your kids are this old, number one, if you drop your ice cream on the floor right by the toilet, I'm talking right next to it. Did you know, Rich, you can pick it up and eat it? Not only did I not know it, I'm not sure I wanted to know it. Well, my grandkids, uh, they told me it was okay. Well, so. then they're right. Yeah. Also, uh, don't do hopscotch after drinking scotch. Oh my gosh, man. <laughs> it's not, that's it, not why it's called hopscotch. No, man. Uh, yeah, I thought it was, but evidently it's not. Boy, it causes uh, that alcohol to course through your uh, bloodstream once you start hippity and hoppity and, uh, well, down that hopscotch. Uh, I got <laughs> a good board. one for you. Don't okay. play hopscotch without shoes in Yuma anytime yeah. In May onward, till maybe yeah. like December twenty fourth. Well, you or know, you'll have could, bacon for feet. Well, it could uh, you know, it lend to you know, a toughen the warrior and wild men uh, subscriber up. B, it could uh, expedite the game if you only have a, a short amount of time to play. <laughs> and and C, you know, you I call develop, that a win win. You could develop win-win. world champions at hopscotch playing on those hot sidewalks. Come on, somebody, yeah, get, get them going fast. Hey, I uh, got some, I uh, got some great. Uh, Emails and comments coming through YouTube and the website and yep. Facebook. You see DJ? That's he a said great God one. told Yeah, DJ, it's uh it's off uh, our episode eighty eight about talking uh about getting your butts out of your ruts. Uh he said that God told him he is going to turn me like a top and he's gonna use me for his kingdom. And that was in two thousand and fifteen. Today, after he listened to Get Your Butt Out of Your Rut. He said, God kicked me in the butt, and he said, stop being lazy. Get out of this rut you're in. Hey, who writes yeah, get that, get out of Rich? the rut you're in. Who, yeah, Rich, who writes that level of honesty? It's usually like, I hate you. You guys are the devil. This guy's like, man, you pegged me. Uh, I'm in a rut. I felt God call me in 2015. It's 2019 right now. Uh, thank you for the ass kicking, Rich and Doug. That's what we do. That's yep. your gift. That's my gift. Great email, man. Hey, Great Doug, I'm, com- I'm pretty sure I, I'm with DJ on that. I'm pretty sure that that episode kicked my butt because I find myself to get in ruts in different area of my life. So I'm way to go, DJ. Be a man. Dude, all, all the time, man. And, and <laughs> you know, it's funny is uh, this guy goes, um, he said, hey, I noticed you stopped doing X, Y, and Z. He goes, uh, why all of a sudden a change in behavior? Like I haven't noticed you change anything. <laughs> so you're you're to, you're to tell me right now that you're perfect and that there's there's no you know more evolution, no more morphine of moi. Uh, I hope you see me change a bunch of stuff because that's what Rich and I are talking about and getting out of ruts, whether it's spiritually, yep. uh, ministerially, relationally. We want to always be changing because again, God's immutable. We're mutable. Uh, he never changes. We're in a constant state of flux. It doesn't mean we're flighty. It means if we spot anything, smell anything, uh, realize anything is on toward towards uh, the Holy One, then you know what? We're going to put an axe to it by yep. the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, right? and you know, and and that's the reality, Doug. When we talk on the phone to each other, not just in the podcast, like this isn't some thing that we we whoop up and try to manufacture. When we talk on the phone, basically, that's what we're talking about. This is where I'm at with this. I need, help me out. I need to get some vision with this. What do you think about that? Yeah, do that. Hey, you need to do this. You said you were going to do that. Yeah. How do we take warriors and wild men to more people to help more people? How do I do this with my family? What do you think about that? Really what it is, is it's, it's going on to perfection. It's trying to be more Christ-like pushing each other to not stay satisfied with the status quo. And like they say, yesterday's successes are today's mediocrity, tomorrow's failures, you know? So we're always pushing each other and that's what warriors and wild men is here for. I want to read another great one. This is by Steve Klassen, and uh, he was talking about the Cabela's one, the episode yep. that we did on Cabela's. He said, love you guys. I listen every Sunday morning. 
I'm a pastor in central Illinois. I appreciate the honesty, straight talk, and willingness to confront BS. I purchased one of Doug's books, already passed it on. Keep up the good work. Boom. That's awesome, man. That's, a, that's, what, that's what we're talking about. That's the people we're talking to. Hey, uh, Rich, uh, uh, you know this, obviously, uh, the Warriors and Wild Men enthusiasts, they know it. Uh, I got kicked off Facebook October 11th, 2018, 2 million followers, eight different pages. Uh, we were killing it over there, and they're like, oh, you, you're saying stuff that uh, Ocasio-Cortez doesn't like, so we're going to deem it fake news, and we're <laughs> going to deplatform you. So I miss stuff on Facebook. You sent me a message uh, by Gwen uh, uh, Bartolini, and um she told me in the message that our our podcast and, and uh, my book, Raising Righteous and Rowdy Girls, has spurred her to do this consummate podcast with Warrior Chicks. And she put a Facebook review on our Warriors and Wildmen page that I'm disallowed to go to. <laughs> <laughs> I sent now. it to you. Yeah, yeah but uh, she, she put another review okay. down from the message. She goes, these guys speak truth. Check them out. Common sense for the masses. And Lord knows, she says, we need it. Thank you, Gwen. That's Great awesome. stuff. Hey, listen, uh, uh, this is what's uh, interesting too, Rich, is that our demographic on Warriors and Wild Men, and I don't know it, uh, you know, to the to the T, to the specific, I think it's 50-50, women and men. Yep. There's a, actually a lot of, I was surprised, there's a lot of women listening to Warriors and Wild Men, I think, because... They want to live for God. They want to be radical, but they also want to see men step up and be who they are. But but I'm I'm believing that the stuff that we're saying is helping them out too, and that's cool, man. That's 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 a blessing. And you you listen to uh, uh, again, you know what we're talking about getting out of ruts. That's not just dude stuff. I mean, yeah. girls get in ruts. Good Lord, man. So um, you know, people are like, well, I don't know if girls would like listening to what you have to say because. You guys are so rough and tumble and you're smoking cigars and you're drinking the devil's backbone and <laughs> imbibing deeply on coffee. And uh, and we're like, um, you know what? I think the girls like it. Yeah, we're just, making sure, it. we're just making sure they don't think it's a Mormon podcast. Exactly. <laughs> All right, man, let's dig deep. I got a spade uh, today. Let's talk about calling, uh, Rich, calling. And um, I don't hear, you know, too much uh, in kind of your... You know, easy breezy, summer squeezy, light a fart community church about calling. It's all just salvation. You know, Jesus just wants to save your soul and to keep you from hell. Hey, listen, I don't want to go to hell, but uh, that doesn't mean I have benevolent mo- motives. You can you can be like Finney said. You can, you can be way mooey selfish and uh, say yes to Christ because nobody wants to go to hell and sit in some kind of sulfuric ravenous cave with ragged clothing. Right. I don't want to go to Holiday Inn, much less hell. <laughs> and, uh, and most people, Rich, that's all they talk. Jesus wants to save your soul. Here's what I find interesting, and this is one uh, the, the thing I want to toss in your court, Rich, as we queue up for this bad boy, is, um, you know, I, I look at Christ when he uh, intersects to bring— uh, up a, a popular politically correct word with us fallen critters, like in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He doesn't say hardly anything about heaven except to the thief on the cross because he had no life to live. He's in his he's in his waning few hours, and he said, "This day you're going to be with me in paradise." All the other stuff, it uh, Paul's conversion. He didn't say, "I you know you're going to go to heaven now that I knocked you off your high horse." He didn't say to Peter, "Now that I broke your nets and you confess you're a sinner." He said, I'm going to secure you a place in heaven. He said, vocation, I've got a call, i got a yep. vision. You're going to be a fisher of men, diddly squat about skating from hell's furious flames. Yep. Hey, and, and I've been talking about uh, Hebrews chapter 11, about the heroes of the faith. And the incredible thing about that is everything they did was focused on the fulfilled promises that wouldn't even come in their lifetime that would come in heaven. But check this out, Doug. None of those ideas of fulfilled promises were people's mentality about heaven now. It was the fulfilled promise of being with Christ, being Christ-like, fulfilling their destiny, fulfilling their purpose. And you know what that equaled? Doing the greatest exploits the world has ever seen. So if you wanna focus on heaven, do it like those guys. To the point, like the great revivalist said, this life is nothing but a dressing room for eternity. Like if that's how you wanna think about heaven, then let's do great exploits in faith. If your idea of heaven doesn't equal something on earth, then you're too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. I'm throwing out all the best cliches today, man. I'll tell you what, I, I, I'm, I'm done and you with let cliches. Kurt, 
You're like Kirk Franklin, man. I know, man. I'm say, yeah, that's why we pray. That's MC hey, uh, Hammer. I met, uh, that's I MC Hammer, Kirk, by the way. I met uh, Kirk Franklin at a conference we were doing in uh, Cape Town, South Africa, and we're in the green room, and I just got through. He just got through rocking the stage. I come in there. I think I did the pit bull attitude. Freaking killed it, man. Had everybody howling and uh, and convicted. All they're laughing and crying all in one whack, Rich. And go back into the green room, and I'm just standing there uh, talking, minding my own business. And Kurt goes, he goes, brother. He goes, I like your shoes, man. He goes, where'd you get those shoes? <laughs> I go, they're Johnston and Murphy's. I think they're like eighty bucks at Dillard's. He goes, and he pulls out a pad and he writes it down. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> hey, uh, let's uh, let's. Uh, I'm going to read a chunk of scripture, uh, Rich, and, and um, uh, not too big, but I want to set this up in regards to calling in the in the salvific call to the center so that uh, we really hammer down on it. None of this stuff gets missed in you know our supposed call to a relationship uh, with Christ. Paul's rehearsing to Agrippa of his past and killing Christians in Acts 26 or trying to get them to blaspheme or deny Christ in some form or fashion. Then he rolls into what happened to him uh, when, when Christ knocked him off his high horse. He said, while so engaged, I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me. It was a freak festival. That's the King Doug version. Yeah. Those who are journeying with me blew their minds. And when we had all fallen to the ground— isn't the Holy Spirit gentle? Frickin' knocks them to the ground. And Rich, they didn't have a catcher to lay him down and then put a hanker- handkerchief they over didn't, their crotch. They didn't put a courtesy curtain over him? <laughs> no. He said. Uh, he goes, I heard a voice in the Hebrew dialect, uh, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the, against the goats. And I said, Lord, who are you? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Get up, stand on your feet. Now check this out, Rich. For this purpose... I have appeared to you. Jesus is appearing to this person for a purpose. A purpose. Now, yeah, now listen closely, because he doesn't say diddly squat about heaven or avoiding hell. I've appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things that you've seen, but also the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jews and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they might uh, turn from darkness to light, from the dominion to, of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance uh, among those who've been sac- sanctified by faith in me. Consequently, Agrippa, I didn't prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. Boom. 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 All right, so just to break it down for those who, uh, uh, who might be fans of occasional cortex and you're not really into reading or understanding or paying attention, Christ knocked Paul off his high horse for a purpose, said nada about uh, heaven or escaping hell's flames. All that's kind of a given if Christ is showing you up. But he did talk big time about purpose. And Paul said uh, at the end of his life, right before he was going to get tossed into jail and then get killed, he said, I didn't prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. So entailed in Christ coming to your little uh, 2020, your, your little 1020 rather is, uh, this thing called a purpose and yep. a vocation. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I love those scriptures because it, God shows his sovereignty. He shows his authority. Paul's first response is, who are you? The Lord says, this is who I am. And you know, what's followed up by that. This is what you're going to do. So, you know, why am I here? You know what I mean? The number one purpose is to know God, but guess what? The second one's right after that. That's the calling. It's what is my purpose. I'm, I'm going to read a quote, Doug, that doesn't seem like it would fit here because of the author of the quote. Uh, it's George Bernard Shaw. People get annoyed, but I, I'll uh, take it. I, I love it. This is it. This is one of my favorite quotes, by the way. This is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, the being thoroughly worn out before you are thrown on the scrap heap the being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to make you happy. Come on, Doug. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, take, uh, I'll take that from old Georgie boy instead of, again, you know, the, the incessant, constant whining that we hear Christians and how they'd just rather die and just go to heaven and leave this poor antichrist-filled world. Uh, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not the voice of the martyrs. 
that's not the voice of the overcomers. Yep. Uh, but here, here, Shaw, you know, uh, clearly uh, never, I don't think he ever confessed Christ. He might have done it on his deathbed or something, but he wasn't some teetotaling evangelical. And uh, he understands the will to war. Church doesn't. He understands right. being a force instead of a farce. And uh, again, you know, do I want people to understand that they've been freed from the, from, from Dante's uh, hibachi grill forever and ever, and they're never going to sit on one of his concentric circles? Yeah. But you know what else I want people to understand is that you're salvaged, you're saved, you're redeemed for an adventure. Come on. As, as Christ put it, uh, to, to do what? Uh, to live this thing called abundant life. Yeah. Now, I know how uh, prosperity teachers have morphed that into, um, you know, you never uh, see one kind of botch do si do in the healthy, square dance Healthy, wealthy, life. and wise? Yeah, no problems whatsoever. I don't know what planet those morons live on, but that's not what Christ sold his disciples. However— uh, as we as we said, and get your butt out of your ruts. Uh, what he's called you to, it's going to be interesting. It's not yep. going to be safe. There there is no <laughs> there is no safe scriptures that are talked about uh, in the Word of God, except where God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the apostles, a prophet, uh, damns those who long for those safe spaces yep. or pronounces some whopping malediction upon their noggin for you know even thinking about trying to do that. We're called to a purpose, man. I think yeah. Paul's uh, was clearly that. And Rich, uh, help the Warrior and Wild Men listener to understand that that doesn't just mean you've got to be a minister or a missionary or a worship leader. Right. This thing's right. broad, man. It's you know broader what? than Rosie's uh, underwear. Man, I'm, I'm glad we're doing two episodes on this because there's, well, it's something that's worth thinking about for more than two weeks anyway. Hopefully we're in, we're in, look, this is not the end of the conversation. We're not exhausting everything. We're, we're trying to instigate the warrior and wild, wild men listener to open up their mind to some concepts so that they can continue to learn from it, right? We're starting, we're beginning the conversation. Um, Jesus said something about that. He told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his, incro- take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life, but would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake would find it. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? So Jesus starts off with, you have to deny yourself. That, that's the first part. Listen to this great quote from uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship, which if you're a pastor or you're a leader, you cannot live your life without reading this book. It doesn't make any sense. If, if you're just a, a guy who wants to follow Christ, you don't have an excuse for not reading this book. It's inspiring. It's instructional. Listen to what he says. When Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. So I think if you're going to answer your call, the first thing you got to do is you got to die to yourself. You got to be born again to, to the king, man. You got to be like, okay, God, what do you want me to do? And then that takes it into the part that you, that you were referring to, Doug. Does that mean I have to quit my job and go become a missionary? A guy told a story one time. He said, I was a pastor and he said, and I had a millionaire named Bob in my church. It would have probably been better to have a billionaire named Mob, but it was a, it was a, million, a millionaire named Bob. And Bob went to this pastor and he said to him, man, I would give anything. I would give up all my wealth to do what you do. That's what he told the pastor. And the pastor looked at him with a tear in his eye and he said, I would give up everything that I have to do what you do. So <laughs> the funny thing is everybody looks at what somebody else is doing and thinks that's what they're supposed to do. I really love God, so I must be a pastor. I must be a priest. I must yeah. be a monk. I must be a missionary. No, you have to be effective in what God has called you to do in every area. And that's stuff that we're going to be able to unpack in this, that there really is no separation between secular and holy. <clears throat> it's all supposed to be serving God, right? Is that, is that where you're going with that? Yeah, that's what, uh, and, uh, you know, great point. Uh, two observations. Um, you know, when Martin Luther came and, and wrecked the papacy and, uh, and, and put his head and uh, stuck it, you know, firmly into the, the Pope's solar plex, uh, one of the rev- revelations that he brought forth was um, the ability and the necessity uh, for, for the believer that wasn't called to ministry uh, to understand that is that, is that God also ordains this thing called uh, the secular priesthood in order, in order for the believers to, to understand and, and appreciate that, you know, it's, well, if you really want to be on fire for God, you've got to get into that ministry, boy, girl, you got to be a woman aglow and, 
and and, and you or you got to be a missionary to BFE or something like that. And 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 yeah, because you know that. Let me interrupt you real quick on that because I want you. I want to in, interject this real quick because it's check this out. What if everybody did that? What if everyone quit their job and went into full time ministry to be a missionary? Christianity is not sustainable. It's not self sustaining. You can't push it. It doesn't happen. So that yeah, is gonna, not a who's model. Rub shoulders, who's going to rub shoulders with uh, the unwashed so like you and I used to be? Absolutely not a model for the church. So sorry. I just want to throw that in there because right before you uh, so share he, that quote. So, so uh, uh, old Marty, uh, back in the 16th century, he, he ordained people to a secular priesthood. Matter of, and again, I didn't know that. Matter of fact, yeah, he said, uh, he said the Christian's worthless if he can't operate in maximum kick-ass mode outside the temple. That's good. And so, so uh, you know, it's like you're a shoemaker, boom, you're a shoemaker for Christ. Man, yes. you're a blacksmith, you make swords, uh, great. Uh, you, do, you do leather stuff for bridles and horses, fabulous. You're a cartoonist, oh my God. Do I got some cartoon ideas to, <laughs> yep. to put across uh, the Pope's bow. And uh, another thing that, that, you know, when, you're, when you were uh, talking right before I went into the Luther thing, about um, calling is uh, Oz Guinness book. I don't know if you've uh, read Oz Guinness's book, The Call. No. Definitely worth reading, man. And listen, Wars and Wildman listener, if I ever tell you to read a book, you should read a book. Oz Guinness, The Call. I think it's uh, written back in 1998. Anyway, I read that. I was uh, I was speaking in London at a uh, big church, uh, Imperial College. I think that's what it's called. And um, I'm reading this book, and I'm a minister. You know, because this guy told me I was supposed to be a minister. And uh, so I was like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, God's blessing. He's doing some crazy stuff through our lives and radio show and books coming out and stuff. And I'm reading Oz Guinness' book, The Call, Rich. And in the, I think it's one of the first chapters when he got converted, parents of the missionaries that went to China, inland China, uh, these guys are heirs of the Guinness Fortune, the Guinness Beer. And uh, so this guy, you know, just gets converted. He's a sharp British cat uh, born in China. And he's like, well, I got to be a minister. And he said that he went on that track of uh, becoming a minister. And he's like, it just doesn't really fit me, man. Doesn't fit me at all. And so what uh, he said he liked, he pulled off. I think he pulled over his Austin Healy one time. He was driving the English countryside and he's gassing it up. And he got to talk to a guy. I think the conversation started about the car. Uh, led into Christ, and he said, boom. He said, I knew that I could never have that conversation if I was a cleric yep. and if, if it was in a church. He said, I love the back and forth without the, you know, the accoutrements of, of uh, our sanctified environments. He said, I just like talking to people yep. where people live. And I, I knew, knew that, that if, if I was, was going to become a minister and get in the cloister, it's never going to happen. And so that's when uh, uh, Guinness formally said, you know, I'm not going to do ministry. What I am going to do is, uh, and he was trained by Francis Schaeffer, uh, spent a lot of time in Labrie. And so he developed this uh, uh, forum called the Trinity Forum, where all they do from a Christian worldview is interface with uh, the leaders around the planet on the most crucial ideas from a Christian perspective that our world is constantly dealing with. I don't think, brother, that would have happened if he would have become a minister. I don't think if William Wilberforce became a minister that we'd see the freedom of the slaves that he pushed and enacted, you know, back in the day either. And so the point that we're trying to get across is uh, you don't have to be a minister. Matter of fact, if you're unsure, frickin' run until God tackles you and yep. says, no, this is what you're going to do. Run from it. We don't need any sucky ministers. Doug, when I— when I- <laughs> Uh, got converted, radical conversion. I went to see a pastor of a church. I went to talk to him. I ended up working for that guy years later, which is awesome. And I told him, I feel like God's calling me to go into the ministry. And he gave me that advice that you just said. He said, if you can do anything else, do it. And he said, and, and if, you, if you can't help it, then become a pastor. And, and I followed that advice. But the, the funny thing about that is this. I don't obviously don't look like a minister. I don't dress like a minister. I, I don't tell people that I'm a pastor and it's not because I'm ashamed of Christ. They know that I'm a Christian when we're talking because no matter what topics that come up, I don't say Jesus said this, Jesus said that, but they just know because once we're talking, you know, and, and I try to get to know people before they find out I'm a pastor. And sometimes right. they'll even ask me, Doug, and I feel like it's too soon for them to know. They say, and I, I'm telling you, Doug, I do this all the time. So what do you do? 
I can't tell you right now. It's still classified, but I'll tell you later. And I've done that with multiple, <laughs> multiple people. And here's awesome. why. Because the second that they find out I'm a pastor, they, uh, they, box, they back brother. up a little bit, Doug, and they go like this. They go, hey, I'm sorry for the language that I was using. And I tell them, hey, that's the reason I didn't tell you because I don't want right. you to be sorry. I want you to be yourself. I don't want yeah. you to change how you behave. I want to have a conversation with you. I want to be your friend. And there, it takes them a little bit, but then they realize I'm, I'm sincere. I, I can, yeah. Even if they don't come to Christ, I can love them. I can be friends with them. But they also know that when they need somebody, that they can talk to me. And then that's how, that's how I win people to Christ on a personal level, right? I, I have a quote, Doug, from Oz Guinness. Before you read that, I got oh, go to go tell you this. I got to tell you this. Rich, like when I was in the ministry, I was at this hunting camp and uh, I won't, I won't tell you what state I was in and, uh, dude, we're, we're lighting up the pigs. We're shooting, you know, wild boar. We got our big guns out. We're just having a great time. And, and, uh, this, this goofball, he comes in and it's like, so man, he goes, what do you do? And I was like, I don't like, you know, I got a radio show. I was like you, I didn't want to say, you know, I'm born again, Christian again, not because, uh, any shame factor. I just don't want to make the atmosphere weird, weird and fake. everybody and start, fake. you know, yeah. And, uh, and that's not on me. That's on them. So anyway, um, uh, because like Popeye said, I, I am who I am. And, um, so he, he <laughs> my buddy goes, Mary Margaret usually does this, but my buddy goes, oh yeah, he's a pastor too. And the guy goes, well, preacher man. Oh, we got him, got ourselves a preacher, man. It's like that girl, you know, uh, calling out to Paul, you know, these are yeah. servants of the most high God. And she followed him everywhere she went. He's like, shut up and come out of her, you devil. So this guy, he, he pokes me in the shoulder. He goes, so you against drinking preacher, man? That's like, no, you see my beer right over there. And if you touch me again, this preacher man's going to kick your ass. <laughs> Unbelievable. And that's, that's why, again, that's why I don't. You know, when I was in the ministry, yep. I just don't come out and, you know, look at me. I'm Joel Osteen. It's like, listen, I'm just a dude uh, hanging out with dudes, doing dude stuff. Yep. And, uh, you know, if if the conversation goes that route, then, hey, I'll pick it up. I'm a bloodhound. Yeah, who's, Other than who that, said this quote, Doug? I, I'm just a beggar telling another beggar where to get some bread. Was that Spurgeon? I think that was Robert Downey Jr. in Tropic Thunder. <laughs> I love that movie. Um yeah, it's interesting because when I'm hanging out with my friends and we're not at church, I tell them, do not call me pastor. Do not call me pastor. And people are like, well, it's uncomfortable for me. I said, you know what's uncomfortable for, for me? My name has been Rich for 50 years. Actually, not true. For 11 years, it was Richie. And then, you know, I tried to grow up even though I weighed 74 pounds. But beside the point, I, my name is Rich. You can call me Rich. That's my name. I, I don't call you, hey, accountant. You know what I mean? Right. I don't call you, hey, you <laughs> hey, know. plumber. Yeah, hey, plumber, get over here. Like, I don't call you that. My name is Rich, right. and I don't want to put that off on people. And again, it's not because I'm ashamed. I, I'm not. And I'm going to share with them about Christ. I pray for them. Yeah, again, but, but again, prayed. what you said, man, it's a it's a job description. It's not a title, and it's only the stupid, you know, uh, us versus them, you know, pharisaical spirit that have promoted, you know, the whole pastor, Rich, or yep. pastor, Doug. That's a title you lord over somebody. Yep. In the scripture, Paul said, Paul, chief of sinners, called to be an apostle. Boom. That's a job description. And listen, guys, uh, it's it's no different <laughs> than what Rich said. It's like, hey, electrician, hey, plumber, uh, you know, hey, porn manufacturer, whatever. You don't say that. You say their name. Yep, that's you know? right. And, and, and their you know what, Doug, job. I, and I want to clarify something to the Warrior and Wildman listener. You're listening to this right now, and you might be thinking, man, they're off on a tangent. We are not off on a tangent. We want you to understand something. If you're not ordained officially and in full-time ministry with a title, that doesn't mean you're not called. And your calling doesn't mean you have to do that. Because if you're listening to what we're saying, we don't mistake what we do as a full-time job or an official ordination or not ordained. We don't mistake that for the calling to talk to people about Christ, to be in relationship with people. That's fulfilling the calling, right, Doug? That's, that's what we're trying to say. We're trying to right. encourage you that if you're called, it doesn't mean you have to go into the ministry. Now, some people, you do have to. God is calling you. But you don't have to go into what we have called the ministry. You become a person of ministry, and sometimes titles and positions can hold you back from influence and opportunities that you would have. I, I want to read that quote from Oz Guinness. Um, it's probably from the book that you were just uh, referring to, The Calling or The Call. It says, 
if all the believer does grows out of faith and is done for the glory of God, then all dualistic distinctions are demolished. That's what we're talking about. There is no higher slash lower calling, sacred, secular, perfect, permitted, contemplative, active, first class, second class. Calling is the premise of Christian existence itself. Calling means that everyone, everywhere, in everything fulfills his or her secondary callings in response to God's primary calling. Come on, man. And then he follows up with the quote from Luther that you were referring to. For Luther, the peasant and the merchant, for us, the business person, the teacher, the factory worker, television anchor, can do God's work or fail to do it just as much as the minister or missionary. Boom. Boom. End of the podcast. No, I'll, and uh, my, my wife, my wife, uh, she's been a teacher for uh, nearly 20 years. And, um, you know, uh, teaching doesn't pay well. She does it as a missionary. She, uh, we've never, we never lived off her income. We've banked uh, most of it away. And, uh, you know, people think, well, you know, Mary Margaret, she's just a teacher. Uh-huh. Well, let me tell you, let me, first of all, if, if Mary Margaret puts her crosshairs of love on you, oh my gosh, uh, you're going to fall in love with her. Cause, uh, she, she's like Nathaniel man in John one fifty one. When he rocked up and Jesus is looking at a sinner who obviously is sin based. And he says of this sinner, he says, you've got no guile in your heart. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, there's nothing, you know, twisted about you. That's Mary Margaret. There is nothing twisted about her. She loves supremely period. And she takes that uh, cone of love man into the classroom, her love for country, her love for constitution, her love for our founding documents and her love for Christ. And uh, like I told you in one of these other podcasts, she was like, hey, you got to come speak uh, before we close out this semester. I want you to speak to my Bible study. Dude, I thought she was had like 20 people. It's freaking three, 400 kids in there. Jeez. Memorizing the scripture, praying. Bro, when we started praying, it sounded like somebody slapped a hornet's nest, man, with those little kids just praying, you know, getting fervent and stuff in that. And uh, you mean to tell me uh, a pastor's job? is more important than what Mary Margaret No did. way. No way. Absolutely not. And I'm not saying hers is, is more important than his. It's like, guys, you've got to see this, whether you got a Christian business, whether you're an actor, uh, whether you're a geek, <laughs> like Edward, or Ed, what's that guy's name who exposed uh, the NSA and stuff like that and how they're spying on oh, us. Snowden. And Snowden. Yeah, Snowden. Artists, uh, if you're into music, film, Good. I mean, look at Tim's story, man. Tim's story, black, good-looking uh, evangelist, and he said, you know what? I think I can do more uh, stuff with making movies. And I think one of the greatest movies from a Christian perspective, if you're a girl, is uh, think like a man, act like a woman, where it champions chastity, chastity but, but not, not some, some you know gross, stupid, Christian, garbage, cheap-ass movie type with way. Bad, Hilarious with, with stuff. With bad theology, some of those movies. <laughs> yeah. Hilarious stuff. What's it got? Kevin Hart's in it. Beautiful girls. And, uh, you know, it's not it's not G-rated. It's PG-13, man. You see some makeout se- sessions. But at the end of the day, the message is if you can get a guy to not try to get you a cookie, which means you're for JJ for 90 days, he's probably legit. And you see the Bible in, getting studied and talk about the whole way through it. I guarantee that probably did more than all of the great stuff that Tim's story did from a cultural pre-evangel standpoint than a thousand sermons that he preached to Christian audiences. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, so when we're called, we got to be called where we're at to do where we're at, to follow God, to do what he says, to deny yourself in every aspect, every business, family, relationships, and whether you're called to what we call the ministry, which I, I hate that. Um, you know, professional vocation as a minister. If you're not called to that, doesn't mean you're not called. You're called. Every Christian is called, just like Paul. Not his calling, but your calling. You meet Christ. Who are you, Lord? This is who I am. Let me tell you what I want you to do. You know, um, here's a great quote. God doesn't need our good works, but our neighbor does. It's like, okay, well, I I got (laughs) saved. That's good. Awesome. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to be as weird as I can. Your neighbor needs you to be not weird and need you to love them and need your good works because that's how they're going to meet Christ. Here's another thing, and um, uh, <clears throat> I'll let people absorb that one because you just hit them in the nutsack. 
Here's another thing that I think uh, needs to be talked about because you don't hear anything talked about uh, this very much anymore in in the whole, you know, what's my vision? What's my purpose? What's my destiny? Uh, hey, your call could be to raise your children in an atmosphere of love in the word of God and you being their mommy and you not pursuing a career you're pursuing their little souls and their tutelage into greatness and training them into the next generation of freaking fire breathing kingdom people. Yep. And I, I, I see moms all the time. They're like, well, I just don't know what my call is. Like, there's your call, man. Yeah. Raising that next generation. Yep. Don't you feel bad about it? Cause you got some chick with a pencil skirt on and six inch stiletto heels. She calls you a slave to those kids. She's a slave to that boss. That's right. In business. But I'd rather be enslaved to the next generation and my family than some jackass that doesn't give a rat's ass about me who will fire me if I don't jump through his hoops or have yep. sex with them. Well, and think about this. The reality is raising your kids, committing to your family and doing those things, which we're not, look, we're not saying that all women are called to do that, but some women are called to do that. So it's not the Holy Grail, but it's also not something to be looked down upon. And the awesome thing about it is when you do that, you open up opportunities to help other moms, some single moms that are trying to do it by themselves, other married women that are raising their kids, you can get together. That's a great way to win people too and, and to help people. That's a ministry, man. That's not a joke. Yeah, um, we just had our grandkids here for a couple of days as uh, Hannah and Joe are up in uh, Colorado. <clears throat> and uh, so we get them without mom and dad. Two days rich, and uh, Hannah sends me a text. How's the how's the babies doing? And I sent her a text back saying, "You guys did an amazing job. The kids are great." And that's not just because. Listen, man, I know they're my grandkids, and I know I dote over them, but it, I I wouldn't spew bullshit. You know, it's like uh, we had to hold them down, tase them, duct tape them, uh, have five uh, <laughs> five exorcism sessions with an old priest and a young priest and holy water and. Freaking Daphne's head's doing three, 360 and spewing uh, uh, green pea soup. I'd tell her that. You know what? They're loving. They're fun. They're responsible. And all at the ripe old age of four and two. And guess what, man? That doesn't come through uh, dumping them off at child care. That comes from mom and dad paying attention. Yep. Damn it. Yeah, and there, there's a great quote. It says, uh, it was a mom that said this, said, I'm changing the world one diaper at a time. And uh it might be, ha ha, no, that's a big deal. I mean, the kids are a great investment. So whatever you're doing, wherever you're at, wherever you're called to be, answer the call because you're called to Christ, first calling, second calling, you're called to people. Got to answer the call. I think Rich just ended the podcast, man. So what do we do, Rich? Warriorsandwildmen.com. Sign up, subscribe, join us, um, listen to our podcast, tell your friends, uh, rate us, review us, like us, send an email, send us a message. And uh, if you feel like you want to support this ministry and help us get it out, you want to get it to some more people, you know, it doesn't happen do it. for free. We're invested, you know, if you want to invest yep. in that, I think it's good soil. So you can do that. You know, we're not, we're not taking sponsors and advertising yep. and all that. But if, if you want to help support the mission, man, we'll be, we'll be glad to make good use of it. Absolutely, man. It's a legit uh, field. It's a war chest. And um I think we're 90 episodes into this, so um, it's it's decent soil. It's decent soil, right, Rich? It's pretty good. <laughs> All right. Great stuff, buddy. 